Good afternoon. Welcome to the first SDG house in the world. That's where you are. Great. Mr. Philippe Lalio, uh, Ambassador of France, Mr. Emmanuel Faber, CEO of Danone, and Mr. Andrew Cassoy, co-founder of B-Lab, uh, welcome here. And my name is Mark Schneiders, I'm the CEO of KIT Royal Tropical Institute. It is, it is um, B-Lab is one of our most, uh, well, one of our very active members. We have very many active members here in the SDG house. Uh, and yeah, it's, um, we have very many more B Corps here in the building. Um, KIT founded SDG House uh, over a year ago to bring together over 100 enterprises which are here, social enterprises which are housed in this building. We now have four or five hundred, four to five hundred people who are all working towards the SDGs. And that gives a lot of energy and activity. And so we are very happy. This is something which changed in the past four years. KIT has a very long history. Uh, we are over 100 years old. But this is a new sense, a new purpose for KIT in the coming years. So it's great to have uh, B, uh, B Lab and B Corp here. And it is also very nice to have a meeting uh, and an, uh, an afternoon like we have today. Um, it is, uh, this is the only thing I wanted to say. I'm your host today in this building, and I was just asked to, to, uh, to welcome you here, and I will give the microphone now to Marcello Palazzi, uh, with whom we work a lot together. Thank you, Mark. So, um, Mark, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. I think it's, this is also always, for me, an amazing room. I love this building. I remember many years ago being in this building, and suddenly when Mark and I met a couple of years ago, said, B Corp have to be in here. So this is an amazing place to be. So welcome, everyone. And I have a question, actually, to start with. And the question is, why are we here? So why are we here? So can you please let's take 15 seconds each to think about why we are here. And then you, get, you talk to the person next to you or behind you, and in 15 seconds you say why you are here. So please, we start now, 30 seconds. Why are we here? Okay, so thank you, thank you, and uh, so then I have the right now to tell you why we are here. So what I'm going to tell you is that um, we are here to change the world. We are here to create a different economy. And I start by saying this week, actually this week beginning today, is the meeting of the G20 in Buenos Aires. So the B Lab movement, the B Corp movement, uh, created a letter together with the B team and the global steering group for impact investors with the sort of three conditions or three requests. One is to create the global impact economy, so the economy that is sustainable, inclusive, regenerative, restorative, and not the economy that we have had for too many years. Secondly, a courageous leadership. We need courageous leaders to create this kind of economy. And thirdly, a collaboration across the sectors with cities, with NGOs, with philanthropists. So the B Corp movement, 2,720 companies, 80,000 users is unleashing together with others this sort of movement to reach our governments and start changing the rules of the economy. Uh, so it's great that we're doing this and I wanted to inform you about this. Second thing is last week we were in Chile, in Chile with a meeting of the South American B Corps, a thousand people in a room, in two or three rooms, uh, amazing energy. A month and a half ago we were in New Orleans. <laughs> the people of the B Corp community in the United States. 
Next week in Bologna is the Italian B Corps, 350 B Corps. So it's just, uh, uh, I think we have unleashed the movement. And this is what this afternoon is all about. Uh, two more things. So I'm Marcello Palazzi, co-founder of Bilab Europe. I'm also together with Lorna Davies, global ambassador. Lorna, Lorna is actually the person who triggered this whole event. So Lorna, thank you. Uh, And then I'm going to introduce the speakers. So um, first is Annemieke Robeck. Ladies first. Annemieke is uh, a friend, 25 years. She, uh, with a few of us, Peter Blom, Triodos Bank, and Banco, and Ben and & Jerry, and Ethel Rodiger Body Shop, we were already sort of starting this journey 25 years ago. Annemieke is uh, both a professor, board member of ABN AMRO and KLM, and has a strategy consulting. So Annemieke, I want to thank you for accepting to be a moderator here tonight. It's a great honor. So thank you. Second, thank you. please. Second is Andrew Kasoy. So Andrew, please come to the uh, stage here. So Andrew. <laughs> Co-founder of B-Lab uh, after uh, maybe 25, 20, 20 years in finance in between <laughs> New York, London, and Tokyo also working with Michael Dell, he decided that um, there was a vision that kind of caught him to, to help create B Corp. So he's one of the founders of B Lab 12 years ago, and he has committed a lot of time and money to support this movement. So Andrew, and thank you, Andrew, for allowing me and my colleagues to set up B Corps in Europe. Thank you. And then finally, Manuel Faber, if may invite you to come up. So Emmanuel is not. <laughs> so Emmanuel is not your typical CEO. He's not your typical CEO. So I, I is an amazing combination of someone who is a visionary. He has a real a radical sense of what humanity is about and what business needs to do for humanity. Secondly, he also was a COO of Danone, so he's also the very special combination of a numbers person, someone who knows the numbers and knows how to run a company, and a visionary. And then thirdly, uh, I must say, Manuel, from when we first met, I really felt that uh, you totally embody the sort of leadership that the world needs and the world that, and the B Corps need. So with no further ado, big hand, thank you for being here and for also being one of the biggest champions of B Corps. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcello. Before we start, I have to say something about the furniture, <laughs> about these seats we have. Um, they are from um, Plastic Whale, and it's a very special company. They fish the plastic out of the canals, and then they recycle them, and they make, uh, in fact, every part of what you see from the, uh, the seats we have here is recycled. Um, and uh, so if you don't see plastic in our canals, you know why. Yeah? Okay. Welcome also from my side. Uh, it's an uh, enormous honor to, uh, to be asked by Marcello and, uh, and B Corp Europe to, um, to, to be here and to help to steer this uh, dialogue, this conversation. Later on, we only have one rule, and that is if you ask questions, no more than seven words. <laughs> All right? Seven words, and we all can count to seven. Today we are here because we are in the SDG house, and we are uh, with B Corp, B Lab, and the SDGs and B Lab are doing something special. They're going to join forces for a better world. And I think that one of the successes of the SDGs is that they really provide us companies, NGOs, governments, individuals, a very strong and easy and understandable framework 
to guide us in our strategies to do better. And as a strategist, I can see that many companies um, all over the world are following it because it is such a good framework. And every actor can contribute to it. You don't need to be a hero from day one to be active in the SDGs. And that's in fact the same with B Corp. Because also B Corp don't ask you, doesn't ask you to be the hero from day one. You may learn. You can learn from each other. We are a learning community. And we are in a very diverse community here to learn from each other and to see how we can make the world better. Now, I think, and that is something uh, I hope to hear later on uh, um, in, in the conversations, that particularly B Corp can become the connector to boost the SDGs. And um, not only because you can earn money with the SDGs, I think that's the the least important part, but it is because the SDGs cannot be realized without the participation of business, of all kind of business, and particularly the variety, the diversity uh, of companies we have in the B Corp movement make that we can become a very special force. And at the same time, we also know that the B Corp community wants to um, measure, wants to know how good it is doing, you know, to be transparent. And therefore, it's very interesting also today to hear more about what particularly B-Lab and the measurement tools um, can, can add to make the SDGs uh, become alive, but also to help companies to realize the SDGs. And that's also all done in partnership and collaboration, which is also one of the SDGs. I think that particularly creating networks, alliances, and working in ecosystems, as most of us do, but we are the forefront runners. But that is becoming the new normal. And I think that also there, B Corp really can become, and B Lab, we, we, we interchange the words, sorry, B Lab. Yeah, okay. yeah? <laughs> B Lab as a movement of B Corps um, can act as that connecting and networking force for good to link very different partners together, not to, to convince each other, but to help each other, to learn from each other. And um, I think that would be great if we really can realize that. Um, we will hear today uh, two short contributions from extremely inspiring people. And I feel extremely honest uh, that I may uh, introduce them. Um, I did some homework. And when I was sitting behind my laptop and looking at you, <laughs> my God. I thought, what a fantastic man. How inspiring! <laughs> and tomorrow to I'm wife. sitting next to him. <laughs> this man is a risk taker, and that's interesting, because that's what we like. If we want to change the world, if we want to make it better, we need risk takers from the corporate world. May I introduce you, Emmanuel. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Enrico. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you, you were talking about asking questions, so um, I, will, uh, I will share with you actually the most difficult question I ever had in my uh, business life. And, um, and then maybe we can take it uh, from there, because this has been the Eureka moment for me that led one day to uh, uh, meeting the, the B Corp movement. About 10 years ago, um, I thought we had had our Eureka mo moment about building another economy when uh, we met with uh, Mohamed Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank, and we decided to create a social business, which is a business where, as a shareholder, you do not take any dividend. Any profit you make, you plow it back into the mission. So it's interesting because as you are not going to seek profit for itself, you have to think about what else is this company going to be useful for. 
and therefore working on basically what is this company unique at? What is it going to really bring to the world that makes the world better with, uh, than if this company did not exist? And so we started a, a very small factory in Bangladesh producing a, a very small cup of yogurt, but the most fortified yogurt in the world ever, at the lowest cost ever, and we felt that, wow, that's going to be a great thing for everyone. So Yunus and myself, we go in a village uh, in, in November 26. We go in a village uh, and, and gather um, a group of women uh, all nicely dressed with their saris, and Yunus introduces uh, the, the good things about our product, why it makes so much sense, uh, will help the growth of the kids, bring health, so many nutrients, fortifications, vitamins, etc., etc. And then calls for questions. And at the very back of uh, this sort of tent, there was just a roof, uh, a lady stood. She was the first one in the group. And she says, hello, I'm Yamina. And uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask you a question because today I, I'm doing my yogurt myself with the milk uh, that my neighbor is giving to me. She is giving me this milk because I take care of her children while she is away in the fields. And so now I understand your yogurt is great for my kids, but if I buy your yogurt, how is she going to do with her kids? And so, I will not buy your yogurt. <laughs> and frankly, as a CEO of a company that's been trying to pursue a dual economic and social agenda as Danone for so many years as a company, I have never found a more difficult question. How am I going to do for my neighbor? That's the biggest lesson that I've been taught in business. I thought I was coming with the solution, and Yamina was just challenging us that that solution was not going to be inclusive enough in the economy that we were proposing for her to accept. In other words, she had a meaning of economy which was probably the closest definition that I have ever seen of what oikos, nomos, oikos nomia means. Oikos being this place that we share all together. And how together are we going to manage that place, live together in this place? Oikos nomia. The hand that she was giving to the kids of her neighbor was very concrete. She was not relying on the fantasy of an invisible hand that she could just pursue her own interest and not caring about anybody else. And there was a fantasy of an invisible hand that would take care and allocate resources appropriately in the most efficient way to solve the biggest problems in the world. That, that invisible hand doesn't exist. And this is what exactly she was telling us, telling me. And frankly, the fact that we relied for so many years on the idea that there is an invisible hand has allowed each of us, consciously or unconsciously, to unleash the power of greed, the power of wealth accumulation, to be the only academically thought, scientifically based, market based driver of economic behavior. And why am I so excited about being here? Why am I here? This is what I shared to uh, Anamika a few minutes ago to uh, Marcello's invitation. I am here because I need the energy of the B Corp movement. Because B Corp is exactly about that. Mm -hmm. The model of I take it all and then I give it back, part of it, is too slow. It's too concentrated. Already, as you know, huh, all of you know, 1% of the people on this planet own more than 99% of the rest of the people in the planet. It's a time bomb. It's just ticking. So we will never solve the problems of our neighbors, not only the problems on the other side of the planet, of our neighbors, our local economies, without rethinking economy. And this is what B Corp is meaning. And this is why we decided, and maybe this is where there is courage in, in, in the decision, we decided to approach B Corp, to discuss, um, to start a journey together, and, 
And it's a journey. It's a journey for B Corp. And, and thank you guys for taking the risk of uh, lending your equity and your name um, to, to work with a company as big as ours, because of course we are not perfect. It's impossible for me with 100,000 people around the world to say we're all perfect. I'm not, so why you know, would anyone else at Danone be perfect? And yet it's a journey that getting that business, our business, a better business every day. And hopefully a business that, that is more and more inclusive by design instead of, and again, taking and then giving back. Taking and giving back is not going to solve the problems. And I said, so I can repeat, because I'm convinced about it, that it makes so much sense, because you can, you can look around yourself. It's very clear that I don't think there can be any other goal for market economy than social justice now. We know that. We are a generation that knows that. We see that in the streets, in this city, in Paris, in New York, in Nairobi, in Delhi, in the villages. If there is no social justice, nothing will stand. No economy, no climate fight, nothing. Social justice. And I think B Corp is a way to instill that into the business models. And this is why I hope it will change the world. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Perhaps before I, um, I go over to you, there's uh, one question I would like to ask you. Um, you are one of those very few really inspiring leaders. And I think everybody of us has felt that. And you say in one of your uh, talks or so that self-awareness is so fundamental, but it's also so difficult to reach. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think that is really very essential to understand an inspiring leader. Well, um, yes, uh, you know, self-awareness is the kind of thing that you get when you listen to Yamina. You know, you, I, I was already uh, um, sitting on the executive committee of Danone. I have a big job. I have a big pay. I think about this social business thing. I'm a good guy. I fly over to Bangladesh. I drive three hours. I go in this village. And then someone is just saying, uh, no, I mean, your product is not bringing the solution. And I'm sitting next to a guy that is a Nobel Peace Prize um, and, and an economist. It looks like the kind of lesson you don't want to, to, to be taught. And I think that if you listen carefully, then you become self-aware that, yes, probably there is something there that is worth taking. And for me, self-awareness is basically uh, what... It's a journey that allows the transformations that as a leader, whether it's big or small, and the numbers I don't think are important. They're, they're on, you know, I, I really believe they are irrelevant in, in many ways, actually. Uh, so whether big or small, um, the, if, I don't, if I don't work on who I am personally, I think I'm going to transmit in my actions so many things that are related to, um, that, that are not adjusted simply because I'm not aware of who I am. You know, um, there are so many hidden, unconscious reasons that I want to have to change the world. Not all of them are worth doing what I'm doing. Not all of them are good for the world. And if I don't think hard about this, I, I think the best at the end of the day, I think what makes sense is my ability to, to walk that path of self-awareness in order to make sure that, because I'm, I'm convinced that the, the only gift maybe I can really give is to, to the rest of the world, is to be on that journey of self-awareness. Nothing that I can do can be good for the world if it's not on that path of my, who am I called to become as a person? 
And so, um, and I'm saying this in a, in a sort of a very personal way, but I, I truly believe this, and, and within Danone, uh, we, we, we have started to work carefully, but to really um, encourage people, including our leaders, to go for self-awareness understanding, to go for sessions about who am I as a leader, why, um, what am I conscious and what am I not conscious about, about myself. Because we are living in, a, in circumstances where as long as you ask people to work on uh, the means, the how, there's no reason to ask. But as soon as you start speaking about the purpose and the why, it's very, very important that people think about themselves. Otherwise, you can just be lying and you can just be unconscious of many things and it starts a very dangerous game. It's a dangerous game. So you need to make sure that you, you work on yourself as much as you're trying to work on the rest of the world. Thank you very much for this uh, very personal uh, way of uh, saying what it means. And I think that many of us uh, have our own um, images uh, with that. But thank you very much. Andrew, you're the co-founder of, um, of B-Lab. And now it's a movement. <laughs> so many years later. And... In fact, you started a new life. And I think with what we now see happening with this uh, B Corp movement, you are also with um, the co-founders starting a new journey as well. I very much hope you will um, convene that with us and, and, and tell us a little bit more about it, but also about uh, the very big challenge about connecting B Corp and the SDGs. Let me try. Yeah, okay. Um, let me start by saying that it's, uh, it's inspiring, Emmanuel, to hear you connect the self-work and the personal mm -hmm. journey of self-awareness to, um, to the work of a business and to the work that we have to do um, to change the markets if we want them to actually create uh, social justice or be participants in, in creating social justice. Um, and it's also, it's a bit intimidating that you can do that that thoughtfully in what is not your first language. Um, <clears throat> I, on the other hand, I'm going to try to do this and, and bumble through it in, in what is my only language, English. Um, so I wanted to try to pick up for a few minutes on a few of the themes um, that, that Emmanuel raised. Um, and, and, and so a few of the headlines, and I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. The first is that I think that we are going through a, a unique moment in the history of business where there is a global culture shift taking place that's changing the purpose of business in society. And that is happening because there's a global movement of people, all of you, uh, who are using business as a force for good. And in the process of doing that, I think that we're creating a new operating system for capitalism, one that I hope is in alignment with, uh, with ourselves, with our, uh, with our personal values and the communities in which we do business, and what, one in which I hope is in alignment with the needs of society. In doing that, we're building a more inclusive economy, and I believe that that's going to lead us to a more shared and durable prosperity for all. Um, the other thing I want to spend some time talking about is that I think the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, provide a unifying framework in which we can do that work. Um, because they take those aspirations that we all have uh, and they turn them into specific goals with a specific timeline. And I think that that allows us as a business community to, to think about action. So I think the question is, why do we need a new operating system for capitalism? Well, the evidence is that uh, the current operating system, the current set of rules in which we're operating businesses, uh, don't work. The system's failing. Emmanuel talked a little bit about this, but there's always been a, a balancing act between the private interests of capitalism and the public interests of the people, usually represented through government. And when that alignment, when that balance has worked, we've seen business create extraordinary change in society, extraordinary progress. Jobs with dignity, 
Billions of people lifted out of poverty. Solutions to some of the most difficult healthcare or technology problems on the planet have been addressed using business. Uh, but I think we stand at a different point today where the system is out of balance, where th that balance doesn't exist in the same way. And either despite or maybe even because of many years of economic growth and technological progress, uh, we're experiencing also some huge challenges that we need to address. Rising inequality. Um, there are eight people on the planet, all of the men, uh, who control the same amount of wealth as the 3.7 billion poorest people on the planet. There are a few more billionaires than that, about 42 billionaires, who control 50% of the wealth on the planet. That is extreme inequality like we haven't had in a long time. Um, we are uh, uh, experiencing environmental crises. In my own country, you don't have to look much further than the last couple of months um, of some horrific hurricanes and, and uh, forest fires um, that have killed a lot of people and created an enormous economic upheaval uh, to understand um, uh, how quickly the climate crisis is, is coming upon us. Um, and with those things has come a total breakdown in trust in capitalism. Government too, but in capitalism. People don't believe that business or capitalism serves society. Um, in my country, um, that's led to lots of, uh, lots of chaos in our democracy as well, and I think in many other places. People who have been marginalized for generations, people of color, LGBTQ people, um, have been joined by the white working class in the U.S. in believing that the system is rigged against them. Uh, and in that environment of very little trust, we can't expect to have much cohesion and we can't expect there to be much justice. So I think if the promise of capitalism is to create a shared and durable prosperity for all, capitalism is today failing to meet that promise. And the question is why? The system is built on the doctrine of shareholder primacy. That's the error in the source code of capitalism. It's the idea that the purpose of business is to maximize value for one stakeholder, the shareholder of the business, and in doing so to create as many externalities as possible for everybody else in the system. So those are all evidence that the system's not working for us, system failure, but systems change also requires there to be a viable alternative, a model for business to create value for all the stakeholders in society. And so when we started B-Lab uh, 11 years ago, um, it was with that idea in mind, a little small idea, not, not, a, not a hairy, audacious idea, that, um, that we wanted to contribute to creating that viable alternative, to change the system both by changing the culture of business and changing the rules of business. And so the strategy of B-Lab is first to build a community of thousands of leaders uh, who have the highest standards of social and environmental performance and accountability and transparency, those are B Corps, um, then to help that movement of businesses inspire millions of other businesses to follow, and then to provide those businesses that want to follow with the concrete tools for governance and impact management so that they can improve. And then finally, to help all of us as stakeholders of business in the roles that we play in our lives as consumers or investors or workers support those kinds of business, to support that different kind of system. So today there are, uh, when we started, there were 13 uh, certified B Corporations. They were all small businesses in the US. Today there are 2,700 B Corps. Um, they're in 70 countries around the world. Um, there are more B Corps outside of the United States than in the United States, and, and, and pretty soon the United States will just be a small percentage of those. But in many ways, I would say more important than that is that there are 50,000 companies that are on the path. They're using the tools that B Corp use to get certified, things like the B Impact Assessment, to measure and manage their social and environmental impact. Or there are 8,000 companies that have actually used a new form of incorporation to actually change their legal accountability to become benefit corporations. And that's inspiring millions of people to buy from those companies or start to invest in them or support them. 
So 11 years into the B Corp movement, what, has, what, what, what was meant to be a viable alternative, I think has become a credible alternative. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, I think what started to happen is we're building a much bigger B economy. Um, and it's changing, it's changing quickly. It's no longer small businesses in the US. Um, it's changing the conversation about the purpose of business in society. And large companies are starting to join that movement, but it does take courage. Um, you know, uh, uh, last year or earlier this year, Emmanuel announced that Danone intended to become a certified B Corporation. Um, and as he said, that's going to be a long journey. But the statement um, that they wanted to do that, uh, and I think already subsidiaries of Danone representing something like 30% of all the revenues of Danone have already gone through that process and become certified. That act of leadership has, has encouraged many other large companies to come along as well. There are subsidiaries of many big public companies that have become certified in the last year or two. Um, uh, earlier this year, Amalgamated Bank in the US became the first bank to do an IPO, to become a public company as a B Corp. Um, policymakers are starting to follow this movement and think about uh, the idea of the B Corp or benefit corporations as um, a solution to this problem of shareholder primacy. And so some of you will have seen a, a senator in the US um, recently proposed legislation that would require all large corporations in the US to become benefit corporations, to change their corporate accountability. Um, that doesn't mean that particular piece of legislation is the right one or will necessarily pass, but it's begun a conversation amongst policymakers about how to think about the purpose of business in society and what the right balancing act should be between the market and government. And I think all of those things are really important. With that credibility and interest in the B Corp movement, I think creates an opportunity for us to think about the larger movement of people using business as a force for good. And this is important. The B Corp movement by itself is not going to change capitalism. We are not going to create social justice, and we shouldn't have the hubris to think that we will. Um, but together, with a number of other movements that are working on similar problems, and with activists, and with CEOs and large corporations who have courage, and with some players in the capital markets, I think that we do have that opportunity. And I think the sustainable development goals provide a unifying framework for us to work on that. Um, the SDGs identify the very challenges that a different operating system for capitalism seeks to address. The challenge with the SDGs is that they weren't created for business. Right? They, were, they, they were created as a set of goals for state, for the governments, to think about how to address the major challenges that face the world. And so they need to be translated if we want to turn them into something that can be actionable for business. And so one of the most important things that B-Lab, I think, can do over the next couple of years is to translate the SDGs into an action plan for business. Um, we're really fortunate that a broad range of supporters, that, that, that ranging from Emmanuel to some people in the capital markets to a number of foundations, have started to come together to support creating uh, an SDG platform that lives in the same place as the B Impact Assessment that will be harmonized with the same kinds of metrics that we use uh, in the B Impact Assessment, and that we'll be able to, in partnership with the UN Global Compact, uh, allow businesses to assess, benchmark, and improve on a path towards helping the world meet the SDGs by 2030. So just a couple of other things to say. This sounds great. Uh, and I am really excited about the SDG platform and about the work that the B Corp movement is doing. But there are some huge challenges in front of us, too. The financialization of the capital markets is happening apace. That hasn't slowed down. In fact, it's sped up. Uh, and the financial, the capital markets are an enormous challenge to particularly large corporations deciding to change. They, they, they put enormous wow. pressure and short-term pressure on CEOs. Um, and the breakdown of trust I talked about earlier, we live in a society today where people don't trust their leaders. They think our leaders lack moral courage and that they're careless. And uh, one of the things Marcello said in his introduction is that we need leaders who have courage. I would add moral to that, that we need leaders with more, more moral courage. And this is a moment for all of us together to double down on care and courage as we lead our businesses or as we participate in 
the capital markets. We all have the ability to create a more inclusive economy, one that has more diversity and inclusion in our workforces, one where our workers are paid a living wage, one where we create products that actually restore the environment and use clean energy to do it. And I think, really importantly, one where we don't default to the constraints of market forces all the time. If our framework is the same as it's always been, that idea of shareholder value maximization, just maybe over a longer period of time, then I think this is all self-defeating because we'll only do what maximizes profit, not what is right. And again, I think the SDGs provide um, an important framework there. And I would just close by saying something maybe a little bit more personal. I, I flew here last night from New York uh, after having a long weekend with my family. In the U.S., uh, this last weekend was, was Thanksgiving. And um, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. It's my favorite holiday because um, it's a holiday for everyone. Uh, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a holiday for one group or another group, but it's one for everyone to gather with their families, but also to invite strangers into their homes, to be inclusive, and then to have a moment together to be grateful, to be thankful for what we have. And I think, uh, when I think about like, my hope for the future, my hope is that when we're all sitting around maybe our virtual Thanksgiving table in 2030, what we'll be doing is sitting together, thankful, full of gratitude, that we came together as a business community to drive the world towards meeting the SDGs. Mm. Mm. Thank so you. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice. I'm glad that's done. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> Now we can just have a conversation. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, um, I, I, first I asked you about that movement we are now in. And, and, but did you, did, when you, when you were with the three of you, did you really envision that? No. 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 Uh, when, when we started, um, we had this very grandiose idea, business should have a purpose, uh, and not much else. Um, we quickly realized that we needed something concrete, that there were lots of principles out there, that there were people who'd been fighting to uh, create socially responsible investing or corporate social responsibility for many, many years. We were standing on the shoulders of giants. We mm -hmm. weren't coming up with something new. The, the new was trying to identify a concrete way that businesses could engage uh, and that we could build community so that people would be able to point at something and know this is a good business, I want to support that as an investor, I want to go work there, I want to start one of those, uh, um, I want to buy from one of those. But we didn't know much else and the idea of movement building was totally foreign to us as three people who were coming from the private sector. We, we, you know, to us, a movement meant um, the heroic individual uh, like Martin Luther King standing up to fight for civil rights and so, um, we didn't think that we were doing that, uh, and, and I still wouldn't want to pretend to be, to be that. Either. But do you think that uh, with the B Corps we can boost the SDGs and, um, and really become an even bigger force as a network? I, I do, because I think today, uh, to be clear, what's happened is not about the people who founded B-Lab. Um, what's happened is, is this. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, what's happened is leaders from all over the world saying, oh, that's what I want to do too, um, and starting B Corp movements um, in, in every continent, uh, in most major countries. Um, it's business leaders like Emmanuel deciding uh, th this is what our business is anyway, and now we can use this as a way to improve, to prod ourselves, to ask ourselves hard questions. And I think uh, that what's inspiring to me is that um, this is no longer, like the, the, the people who do this in, in the US, who, who, who might have put a name to it, were just trying to join something or put a name on something that was already happened that has become enormous. And, and we largely, like other than my sitting up here and talking, we're not leading it anymore. The community the is. The community leads, yeah. 
Um, just a question before we, we go uh, um, to the audience. Um, Emmanuel, you are that risk taker and you, I think, you use in a, in a very conscious way the company as a vehicle for change. Um, how did you envision that when you were, let's say, 20 years ago in, your, in a company? Well, I, I think um, we were blessed at Danone with uh, the fact that um, our previous leaders um, were coming from a family business, yeah. had a clear uh, view already in the 70s that this company uh, would pursue what they call a dual economic and social agenda. And uh, it came to our mind that it was probably somewhere, having grown as a very large company, uh, a treasure that was somewhere, but we didn't know exactly where it was, and we didn't know how fit it could be to the modern life. And so uh, I remember very well a conversation that I had uh, with um, Franck Ribou, my predecessor, um, uh, about the time when we actually met Yunus, which was about why would Danone uh, be unique because you, Franck, are driving it as a leader, uh, being the son of Antoine Ribou, who uh, was the guy who actually surfaced this idea of a dual economic and social agenda. Um, and can we uh, use proof points that this is going to be for real? And this is where we started the journey with a number of people around and, and gathering speed uh, around us with uh, the rest of the Danone people about um, um, adapting that vision to the modern world, like 40 years later, and, and refining the roots of the company, uh, that treasure that had inspired the company 40 years uh, earlier, and applying it to what the company was now, what is at stake when you are a global um, food and, and water and beverage company. Uh, and this is how, the, how it started. And we, I think we did that also, uh, as you say, um, also, you said using the company, but it's also for the company yeah. Bec and, and for the people at Danone. Um, because I truly believe, and, and I'm not the only one, it's a, it's a cultural um, matter, I think, in, in the company that, you know, I'll, 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 you know, I'm coming from a finance background, um, been trained in, in too, a huh? business school yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember in my investment banking days and etc. that people were saying uh, a business starts with cash and ends with cash. So cash is king. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is not that one. It's a very short-sighted way of seeing things. Elon Musk doesn't have cash. But he has got huge ideas, and he's been able, because he is a truly inspiring person, to inspire many people to give him cash. And the day it will stop will not be because that company doesn't have cash anymore. It's because the people that are behind the company, and sometimes the leaders, are not inspiring enough to the banks, to the shareholders, to the customers, to the suppliers, mm -hmm. to lend equity to these guys. But that's and so everything yeah. is about people. And so, sorry, I'm, I'm too mm -hmm. long, I realize. but. It is to say that uh, we, we tend to look at economy as everything with financial glasses. Yeah. And the reality is that everything is about people. I mean, fundamentally. And so this idea that we had to, to resurrect the dual social and economic project, and today, you know, put it as this broader idea of maybe one day becoming a certified B Corp. Um, and, and going for the SDGs in our 2030 goals um, is, is, an, is a huge driver of the motivation for our people to, to join our company to, and to make the extra effort, not just delivering the profit. They deliver the profit because they know that's the license to operate to do all the rest, which is w making a lot of sense for them. Thank you so much. The floor is open, and I, um, I know that many of you would like to ask a question. Um, and we have some assistants helping us with the microphones, and 
Great, thank you. I would like to say that you may only ask questions with seven words. Seven words. <laughs> seven words. Oh, that's the rule. Huh? Um, now you how? may. Two. That's two. That is a brutal rule, by the way. Seven words. To align B Corps with Donut. Well done. Oops. Kate Rayworth's Donut, the, the thresholds. I totally didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. <laughs> so now you have to use more than seven words. Okay. <laughs> So Kate Rayworth's donut, we saw Kate Rayworth in the video beforehand. She talks about the ecological ceilings and social foundations, so the thresholds that we have to operate within. And the B Impact assessment calls, gives points for using context-based sustainability, which makes that link between the company and the systems that they operate in. So I'm just wondering, sort of, can you speak more about how we create change that's fast enough and at scale enough to, to, to get back within Kate Rayworth's donut. Would you like to take this question? <laughs> so I'll give it a shot. Let me, be, let me say one thing, which is that uh, for uh, reasons that will become obvious, uh, the standards for certification sit with an independent body called the Standards Advisory Council, which has people, uh, ex people who are experts uh, both in environmental and social sustainability issues, and there are good reasons for that, because I'm not the standards person. Um, uh, and this issue, I think, is particularly important as we um, get into the scale of dealing with multinationals. Like, there's no question, uh, there's a pragmatic exercise in building this community. Uh, if you start with the view that, um, that consumption in and of itself is an evil, uh, then it's very then it th then it's hard to start anywhere, right? Um, because we're dealing with businesses and businesses grow, and so uh, the question the, the question is whether uh, is whether we can build standards that take that into account. Um, I think particularly with large companies, uh, one of the most important things has been to recognize. Uh, that we need to figure out what the balance is with bringing large companies into the B Corp community. We could have said large companies are inherently a problem and so therefore they don't belong. Uh, but large companies are also necessary if, if we want to solve uh, the biggest problems that we face. Like we can't just do that with a lot of small businesses while large so companies So kind of balance between being radical and being reasonable, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Those are good yeah. words. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, thank you for your inspirational words. Uh, Neil Barrett from Sodexo. Um, the IPCC last month produced a pretty damning indictment on climate and what's happening in the world, and we only have 12 years to bring about uh, change to avoid catastrophic outcomes. So my, my question is, um, businesses' response to the climate change report was pretty muted at best. So w why do you think that was the case? And I guess my other question is, do you think we can make the change necessary in this next 12-year period? That's a huge question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, if we don't try, we will not succeed, <coughs> that's for sure. And the one thing, at least we tried, but I think other companies did the same, is that um, concurrent with the, the UN report that said basically we need to uh, reduce by 50% the uh, absolute amount of emissions by 2030, or 45%, they said. Within Danone, we made the commitment that we would reduce it by 50% by 2030. So our peak emission is going to be uh, about 2025, and then reducing down. Reducing down in particular also because we, are, we have started 10 years ago to engage in carbon positive uh, activities, uh, around our supply chain. And actually, we've done that in a view where 
we embark the agricultural part of our systems because most of uh, the uh, carbon emissions are in agriculture for, for a food company. Uh, so we decided that we would become responsible for that too. So we have a scope three, basically a full scope cycle, where we say this is the total CO2 emissions and we are going to reduce that intensity by 50% by 2030. It's very interesting because when you start doing things like these big commitments, it allows also uh, radical changes in the way people are looking at it. They stop looking at it marginally. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer, and, and I'm sorry because this is really my, you know, just my personal way, and, and there are many others. One big difference was uh, nearly 10 years ago now, we had a discussion here in Amsterdam, by the way, uh, with a group of um, the, uh, the leadership team of Danone, about um, embarking, not in the SDGs, they did not exist, but what we felt were the SDGs for the company. And uh, nature and the protection of, of nature was one. So we decided that we would uh, start reducing significantly our CO2 emissions. And there was a discussion about, are we going to put this in the bonus of the managers or not, the incentives? Because um, not, it's not so much because people are actually working for uh, more money, but it's about being credible as a management, that I'm not only speaking to the abstract world about this, but I put my money uh, where my mouth is internally. And there was a debate at the executive committee level where some people said, well, we don't even know how to measure CO2, so let's start with 5% of the bonus and then we will see over time. And others were saying, well, if we do that, we will never start really. And at the end, Frank decided, he was a CEO by then, that actually a third of the total bonus of the managers would be on these SDGs kind of approach. Part of it was CO2. The thing was relying on a very simple uh, paradigm that we know well in business. No one wants to put a third of the bonus of the managers through the window. So the reasoning was by the end of this year, when we'll have to pay the bonuses, we would have found a way, pragmatic way, to measure the impact. And this is what happened. We finally engaged with SAP and we, decide, we designed together an, a CO2 impact measurement module, SKU by SKU, product by product, which started to become uh, a standard in the company. We would not have done that if that day the CEO of the company had not decided to make that thing a big thing in the incentives. So for me, the same applies to climate change. If we go for small things or believe we cannot, we won't. But I really believe that if, you know, I, I see the level of innovation, including with our farmers, the agricultural companies, the digitalization of the cycles of production for food, for milk, the plastic cycles and everything, that I'm you know, if we can find a way to finance those and to also walk people through in terms of the change of paradigm for people, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, optimistic that we can do that. It's really a matter of setting an ambition that's high enough and, and not be marginal about going for it. Thank you, because I also think that taking that big leap and having that, uh, that great ambition is only sustainable when you measure it. Yes. Because in the end, you have to be credible. Hmm? And we manage um, what we measure. There are some questions, and now I, I, I do not, I go to a woman, because I really want to hear women. With the, the glasses, may I, yeah, because, no, 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 you have to wait until you get a mic. Because I really would like to have some mixes, you know. We, we like to have uh, uh, intergenerational conversations, uh, and it uh, must be a mix. Thank you. So thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, conversation so far. I'm going to try to follow the rule. So how do we change finance? Oof. How do we change finance? Gentlemen. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? <laughs> so beyond the greed, yeah, 
Would you like to start? So, yeah, and then, I mean, I think it'd be helpful also to, to, sure, for sure. Emmanuel to be able to talk about what it's like as a CEO of a, of a public company. Um, it, so I spent 16 years as a private equity investor. Um, and of all the actors in the financial system, I think that investors have the least moral courage. They have the least moral courage, uh, not because they're worse people necessarily, uh, but because the system in the capital markets is uh, even worse than the system of uh, fiduciary duty in, uh, in the corporate world. And I think that that's the case because the capital markets essentially have seven layers of intermediaries between a person's money and what it gets invested in, and none of those people have any incentive other than, no, no way to measure themselves other than what financial return they got this quarter for their investors. Uh, and so that system, is, uh, that system is broken. So if I was gonna do anything other than what I'm doing now, which is more focused on business than uh, on investors, I would start an organization focused on trying to fix the problem in the capital markets. Um, in the meantime, one of the things that I think is critical is that uh, investors are starting to recognize, particularly uh, investors have very long-term uh, obligations, insurance companies, pension funds, foundations. Uh, they are starting to realize that, um, that they need to be much longer-term investors, that actually the risks in things like the SDGs over the long term are actually gonna hurt their financial returns. And one of the most important things I think we can do is help build the body of research that shows that uh, most of those investors get most of their return from how the whole system functions, not from their own individual investment decisions. So 80% of the financial <coughs> returns for most investors, particularly long-term ones, have to do with how the whole market does. And most research shows that how the whole market does is about how uh, the whole system is functioning. And so their, their long-term financial returns as investors are directly tied to uh, these issues of inequality and climate change and many of the other things that are But in also the SDGs. Dan, the measuring of it is very important and being very transparent. That's fine. <laughs> That's your conclusion? Okay. Uh, I'll give it a try, a couple of uh, short ideas or points. Um, first, uh, I, th I fully agree with what Andrew just said, which is that there is a lack of incentive. And the lack of incentive, frankly, is a simple management decision to make. Um, you, know, you take the decision that was made in the company I just mentioned, uh, of having a third of the bonus of managers, uh, 15,000 people around the world, uh, with CO2 including as part of their bonus. Well, many companies are today reporting their CO2 performance. And so many listed companies, if you have a portfolio of such companies, I think you can measure the underlying uh, CO2 reduction of your portfolio by weighted average of how much shares you have in each of these companies. So if someone was able to say, okay, now my portfolio managers, they are going to be incentivized not only on the financial performance, but the underlying CO2 reduction of their investments through that reporting, it will make a difference. Obviously it will. There is absolutely no incentive to do that today other than maximizing the quarterly, the half year, the yearly uh, financial gains. So finance is totally myopic, and it's a matter also of incentives. So that's one, and that's the one that frankly makes, um, you know, would make a decision, doesn't take much other than a management decision. And even the people uh, today, the high-flying uh, heads of investment firms that are talking about long-term, they apparently don't talk to their portfolio managers because their portfolio managers are just not incentivized the way their boss are speaking. And so this is one way of starting this. Another one is don't wait for finance to change. Uh, I'll just give you one, one perspective. We used B Corp to reduce our financing costs. Already it happens this year. Two billion, two billion euros of uh, um, a syndicated credit loan of Danone was refinanced with an interest rate that declines over time as we become more of a B Corp, as we certify more than the 30% and then 35% and then 50% of our total sales. So it means 
that these 12 large, which are the largest banks in the world, basically. So you imagine the, the credit committees with the serious people, their, you know, their, uh, their ties and everything, discussing about um, the, the risk of Danone. They all agreed that Danone becoming a B Corp is a company that has a better credit rating than uh, Danone not being a B Corp. And so this is done. This is not the future. It's already happened. And this is breaking the paradigm, because this is exactly what Andrew said before. They believe that if we address the SDGs and all the risks and with a more balanced uh, approach, we are going to be a more resilient, uh, credit-worthy company. So if that happens to debt, one day you can imagine that it travels to equity and therefore to all what is actually running the show today. It's a small thing, but it's simply to say uh, there is no... I mean, of course, there is a need to, for the grand change, but you can do things one by one, and they still create rooms for maneuver, and they are still signs that things can change. And, of course, at the end of the day, changing finance is changing ourselves. Because the biggest schizophrenia that happens about this is that we, as savers and investors, are not being as choiceful, probably, about uh, how much money we get and where it goes before it goes back and comes back, as when we shop. And uh, when we shop, we take the product and we look back and we, uh, we start to just look about the ingredients. Who are the people behind the brand and everything else? And this is why, by the way, one day I hope that the B Corp logo on the product will actually be uh, a sign of trust. That, you know, we don't do that so much with our banks. So it, it's also about starting ourselves to be conscious about the, the consequences of the way we invest our savings when we have savings, as much as we engage in consumption and production every day. Can I add one okay. thing to that? Oh, no. Can I add one thing about that? But very about short, individual, Andrew, Just quickly also... about individual choice. Uh, it is true that it's easy to kind of get lost in big financial institutions and all of that. At the end of the day, most, much of that money is ours. We just in the US launched a campaign called Vote Every Day. And people immediately think, well, that's about consumers and make the consumer choices you make, and that's true. You can vote every day by what you consume. Uh, but critically, you can do the same thing with your choices as an investor. And so whether that's what companies you're putting your money into, or whether that's what bank you decide to bank with, like how many people here bank with a B Corp bank? You, that's awesome, and it could be all of you. Uh, and so that kind of individual choice, I think, is critical. And people can choose when you vote in shareholder meetings, like you vote your proxies, people could choose to vote for companies to become benefit corporations and make themselves accountable to society, not just the shareholders. So mm -hmm. communicate it. There's a question, yeah. My name is Margaret. Hello, my name is Margaret von Bodegen from Pinwimic in Amsterdam. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Pinwimic to you, Andrew. We are the first B Corps in Holland and the second in Europe, and we are a group nice. of investors. Awesome. Great. So the capital market actually being led by private capital, who is making their own decisions, who put their money where their mouth is, has catalyzed, at least through the Pinwimic stream, 63 direct companies, um, about 50 million direct and about 200 million indirect. That's phenomenal. What we see now with us as a B Corps is that B Corps as a stamp is also easier for us to get through risk committees than that because of the stamp. That's Where great. I wanted to go to also with, um, I can't agree more about self-awareness. So I have one question in a corporation about self-awareness at scale because that's about kind of all of the management layers. We see it ourselves in our own organization, the different levels of self-awareness. Um, sometimes... Um, uh, Seven words? Yeah, okay. Um, so, how do you do self-awareness at scale? And my second question, I'm trying to figure out how to make it a question, is one of the holdups is risk committees. Risk committees are the holdup in the larger institutions. And so, self-awareness on a risk committee. How about that bridge? Uh, who would like to start? Would you like oh, to start? Well, I think that was for me, no? Or? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, they were sort of disguised in questions, but they were not entirely questions. 
yet I welcome that. <laughs> it's a statement and I agree with that statement. Um, the, uh, I, I don't find a challenge to, I don't find it so challenging to, to uh, work on self-awareness uh, at an institutional level because there are many ways, methods, uh, mentoring, coaching, uh, we've done uh, um, MBTIs, we've done uh, you know, many things, uh, 360 degrees. Uh, um, we built training sessions for our leaders, uh, sending them into remote places, uh, uh, sending them into radically different experiences in, in prisons, hospitals, uh, refugee camps, etc. So that um, they have these shocks that provoke the question of, uh, you know, who am I truly and what, what, what is at stake, what do I fear fundamentally. Um, so I think designing that is not so much of a problem. And to your point about risk committees, I personally believe that being able to connect yourself, I should say myself, with my fears whenever I make a decision is the, one of the most precious guides as to uh, how good this decision is going to be. To be conscious of what fundamentally my fears are about the current situation. And I'm trying to, you know, make people around me, but, but themselves have discovered that as well. So it's, but it's a fundamental journey and it's a personal journey. And that's where the limit is, because there is a limit where it can become something that works not for the self-development of that person, but using that for the company. Obviously, this is why I'm doing it, but I have to be very, very cautious in not driving that as a tool. Because you cannot, I don't think you can, I mean, morally at least, I don't think institutionally we feel the right to leverage or to enter into the, the inner circle of the self-awareness of people. So you need to be very, very cautious in ring fencing whatever happens in those circles so that there are um, safe spaces and circles for people to express, to live what they have to live, and then hopefully become, you know, managers that are able to manage complexity better without the company interfering into that. So it's got to be uh, a mutual agreement that it's okay to be on this journey. Um, and so that's how we are, we are doing it. Uh, and, and I agree that we need to be cautious about it. Thank you. There's a short question here, and yeah. I, I yeah. know I only have a few more minutes left, and there are two others, so okay. please be sure. I'm Hugo from Meijerveld, the Dutch SDG coordinator. Seven words. Uh, can one decision contribute to 17 SDGs? Oh, would you like to start? Yes, become it's a, very a B Corp. Nice question, really. Become a B Corp. Become a B Corp. No, but I truly mean it. <laughs> as as soon as Andrew and uh, and the team and the UNGC people are, you know, closing the gap between the SDG indicators and the BIA and everything else, which is badly needed, yeah. if you become a B Corp and you start using these indicators to run your business you will contribute to the SDGs, and so we will. I think that's a sufficient answer. <laughs> yeah. um, we go to that gentleman. In, yeah, uh, and then afterwards we go quickly to the lady in the uh, white pullover. Yeah? Yeah. Hi, this question is for Emmanuel. Having worked for uh, Daniel in the UK this year on a uh, truly uh, cool project with cool people, inspiring to see what uh, also you are uh, as a head of the company uh, indeed uh, presenting. I'm curious, um, what are you expecting from your partners? Partners mean what, sorry? Uh, we are on the IT domain, so like your IT partners, IT suppliers and such. Suppliers. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, we have nine integrated goals. Their, their horizon is uh, 2030. 
One of them is uh, about leading the food revolution with partners. We know we are not going to be able to do that alone, to contribute to the food revolution. That's happening and that's needed. And uh, I was mentioning SAP, uh, having been uh, jointly uh, creating this uh, CO2 measurement, uh, impact measurement uh, together. That's exactly the sort of thing that we need for agriculture, for digital, etc. So we, we expect these nine goals to be a, a way for our partners to connect uh, with us on a journey that, that fits their goals, basically. Thank you. Good. The importance of collaboration, yes. the, the collaborative advantage, and that's also why we are here, uh, to work and to learn from each other, but also to reach out. We go to the final question, to the lady in the white pullover. Um, a question from within a company, to Emmanuel. First of all, thanks for, for sharing and being so personal about how you approach it. My question is, how do you see the diversity um, of SDGs being lived in, in the known, also by different generations? And a question from a millennial to a CEO. Thank you. Great question. And I know you have uh, some thoughts about that. Yeah, well, uh, we, we have, we've made this choice of embedding our goals into the SDGs, so each of them are related, whether we hope to be a, a, a point of focus or a contribution to these SDGs, but basically uh, seeing us there. Um, I'll give you... Uh, the, the way we did it is that we have launched a program that is called One Voice, and My Voice Counts within Danone. So we want, uh, through a process of consultation, digital, of 100,000 people that we have just finished once we announced these goals. Uh, exactly because we believe that it's very important that we got that feedback to inform our strategy about going for them. And so I don't have the answer yet, but uh, because we have, we've just finished that, it's a huge work. We have like uh, 400,000 comments uh, using uh, intelligence, artifi uh, artificial intelligence now to sort of sort out everything, etc., etc., with a quite deep level of granularity, but that will inform us on exactly that, which is how the people are relating to these goals and the SDGs. And my commitment has been that we will report that back to the board and back to the next AGM to share what the result is of this and actually to make that uh, um, consultation inside Danone a routine every year to ensure that the 100,000 people that work at Danone, they have a voice to say exactly what they think about what's a priority or not for us in terms of uh, meeting SDGs. Thank you so much. I know that this kind of conversations could go on and on, and we love it, huh? Um, but you have to get your plane to London, and we have a very nice networking meeting afterwards with each other. So there is a lot of room for conversation, uh, but before I gonna thank my guests, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, convening all the um, benefits B Corps have, but particularly also the next steps we're going to take in the future in measuring uh, the SDGs and combining the SDGs. And thank you, Emmanuel Faber. Thank you so much for being personal, being very close to us, but also taking the risk of being the corporate entrepreneur who, um, who has a vision and who takes us and all his people on this journey, and we really would like to join. Uh, we can be small companies, we can be large companies, we can be finance co companies, we can be groceries. Um, mm. We can embark on that journey, and thank you so much, both of you, for being here and being so close to us all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. This is your exit. Thank you. <laughs> if we can keep everyone just for one quick moment, I just wanted to share uh, what's going to happen next. 
so first, um, this is a very large chair to fill. I'm going to do my best. Uh, but I just wanted to take a brief moment on behalf of B-Lab Europe to thank uh, Anamika for moderating this conversation. <laughs> to thank Andrew Kasoy for flying over from New York to join us. And of course, to thank Emmanuel Faber, who uh, had a very brief moment to come to Amsterdam uh, for just an hour and a half and to make the time and share uh, his journey with all of us. So thank you all. Just a few other couple words. I want to thank Mark and the kit for hosting us in this beautiful auditorium. It's a privilege to have our office located in such a beautiful building and to work with wonderful people. Uh, and I also really wanted to thank my team who helped pull this event together. So Janneke and Ella, uh, the two that are heroic enough to really bring this all and bring us together. So thank you. And lastly, as Anamika said, please join us just outside in the Marble Hall. There will be drinks, there will be bites, so please stick around uh, and let's continue the conversation. As well, there are many B Corps in the room and maybe just raise your hand if you're still here. Hopefully, uh, you can identify them. Uh, they may be wearing this lovely red badge, so feel free to approach them uh, and to share a conversation with them. And lastly, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you.